Okay, we are recording. I am Brandon Polite, Associate Professor of Philosophy at Knox College in Galesburg, Illinois. And I'm joined by Anthony Amon, who is Professor of Philosophy at Northern Michigan University in Marquette, Michigan. So Tony, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks so much for having me, Brandon. This is uh, really flattering to be invited. You've had a lot of uh, really great people on this series. I love sharing the series uh, with my students and my friends. I feel like so many people learn so much from uh, the service that you're providing, and I'm I'm happy to be here. And hopefully, I uh, I'll make you proud. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll we'll find out. Um, <laughs> no, but thank thank you for saying that. I really appreciate it. And so we're talking about your book, Art and Selfhood. Let me face it properly. Um, a Kierkegaardian account. Uh, which came out uh, in Lexington Books uh, in 2019. And I just should note that uh, in addition to writing this book for Lexington, uh, you're co-editing a series of books for them with Adam Bubin on Kierkegaard. And so, you know, before we started recording, we we described you as someone who's not so much a Kierkegaard scholar as a philosopher who's doing applied Kierkegaard, right? That you're applying Kierkegaard's um uh ideas to in, in particular art creativity a, as it relates to selfhood and um you know our, our the sort of project of becoming a self or figuring yourself out and so i guess the the best place to start is could you just walk us briefly through the the project that you're using kierkegaard to help us think about art with yeah i guess i do want to say like uh something about <laughs> I do care about getting Kierkegaard right. <laughs> um, there, there, like for me, there's like th there's at least two broad ways to do this history of philosophy stuff. You can be a contextualist where you're interested in locating the figure and their views in the nitty gritty, like particular historical context in which they lived. And I think that's like a totally important and worthwhile thing to do. It's not what I'm interested in doing in this book. Um, the other project is figure out what the person has to say to our concerns today, which does involve pulling them out of their historical context a little bit and making them speak to questions that might not have directly occurred to them. But I think it's like a really fruitful thing to do. And that's what I'm trying to do with Kierkegaard. All right. But you wanted me to say big project. So um, I have in the past five or six years, I've been working on uh, two big projects. Um, the first project is the project of this book, um, which is how art can help us understand ourselves, how art can help us figure out who we are. And the second big project is about how art can change us, how art can inspire, inspire us to become different people, better people, maybe worse people, um, but how art can move us to undergo these kind of like, uh, especially like these big identity altering changes that L.A. Paul calls transformations. So that's the first project. How can art help us understand ourselves? Second project, how can art help us change and become different? So in the book project, the book, that's the first project, uh, that has two parts too. And the first part is, well, who are we? Uh, what is it to be a self? Um, what is it to be an authentic self and not a poser? Um, do we have authentic selves? Is that just a fabrication? And then uh, I bring a bunch of changes on that question. And then the second half of that project is, once we have an account of what authenticity is all about, how can art help us with that? And how need we appreciate art to get out of it what it has to offer? And if we're in the business of being artists, how might we create art to help with that goal? So if we're dialing into the first half, just real briefly, um, because I know that we're, we're talking mostly to uh, aesthetics people in the audience here probably, um, but I do wanna say a little bit of something about the first half of that project about um, what Kierkegaard has to say about selfhood. Um, the basic idea is that for Kierkegaard, becoming a self is a project. It's not like you are not as you are a self. It's something you have to work hard to undertake. Um, the second big thesis is that it's not a project that you can succeed in by yourself. So he's really against like this Rousseau style, just look inside yourself and find your real self. Kierkegaard thinks that's a bunch of bullshit. That's not going to work. He's also against this like Nietzschean inspired, like just create yourself. You know, there is no pre-existing self. You just got to kind of like use your artistic powers to mold and sculpt yourself. Kierkegaard also thinks that doesn't work. Any attempt at self-reliance is going to fail. You got to look beyond yourself for help. Now, Kierkegaard wants to say like, I know who you should look towards. It's it's God. Um, God is going to tell you who you really are. 
And in the book, what I talk about is like how like, yeah, there's something really appealing about that. Um, God, if God exists, can really answer our questions. Um, the problem is that even for Kierkegaard, God is really deeply hidden. And so even for Kierkegaard, like when we turn to God for answers, we just might not hear them. God may be absent to us, maybe because it's a test or a trial. So this isn't necessarily an attack on theism. Is that like, even if we're theists, that's not necessarily going to be the kind of answer to our questions that we might hope for. But I say that Kierkegaard is right that looking beyond ourselves for help is a good idea. We just need to find different others to turn to besides God. And I think it's friends. And so the last chapter in the first half of that book is about how um, friends can provide us with a lot of external calibration as we struggle to figure out like what sense of ourselves is good and what sense of ourselves is bad. Are we making a mistake in pursuing our goals? What kind of goals should we have? I think all those things are things that friends can help us with. But then there's a problem. Uh, some of us don't have any friends. <laughs> or or we have friends, but they're not the kind of friends that we feel like can help us with that project. Um, or they're not friends that are there at the moment that we need them with. And so the second half of the book kicks off with this idea that like, well, uh, maybe works of art can serve as our friends. Maybe they can provide us with some of the guidance for this project of figuring out who we are that we thought friends might be able to give us. And so I guess that kind of is like all of the backdrop that leads us up to the part of the book that uh, we were going to talk about. I can keep going, but um, that's like, that's the intro that I've had. Awesome. Thank you. And so um, uh, one thought that occurs to me in, in terms of that really helpful summary is that when the friend relationship is going really well, Right, that that project of sort of finding ourselves is a collaborative project. It's one that we're engaged with together. I'm helping you, you're helping me. And if we have more people who are involved in that together, that's that's great. Whereas um, with works of art, it, it seems like necessarily one way, right? Like unless I know an artist, right, who you know who can can help me with this project. Um, it, it's going to be, you know, me reading Tolstoy or me looking at paintings by some long dead person or me listening to music by a star who's so far out of my orbit, um, to, to use that analogy, which worked really well, yeah. uh, it, you know, that I'm never going to engage with them. And so, so I guess, how do you see that relationship between friends and artists with respect to this, this project of figuring out who we are, becoming who we are? Yeah. So that's absolutely right. Um, that like good friends will have some kind of reciprocity to them that we're just not going to get out of art. But that doesn't really bother me um, for a bunch of different reasons. One reason is that I think that friendships rarely work in kind of this ideal recipro reciprocal relationship that you're talking about. I feel like lots of friends I have, like it's a one-way street in one way or the other. This friend helps me out with this. That friend helps me out with that. I help this friend in that regard and this friend in that regard. And it's rarely just this like, I mean, sometimes there is like, especially in the Christian tradition, this model of like fusing, like two become one and we just help each other perfectly with everything. But I feel like that's not actually very realistic. And I guess I'm willing to admit that like, Sure, there are aspects of friendship that can provide us with things that art just won't be able to. I'm not claiming that art is a perfect surrogate substitute for friends, for sure. Like that reciprocal love. Yeah, I can get things from friends that books never can provide. That's not the claim. The claim is just that there is this one thing that friends give us, help with our identity, that art is also be able to do so. And you also want to think about like therapists or advisors to advisee, like that is not like a reciprocal relationship. You know, it is very one way. Um, but I guess I do want to say something else here, like in the therapist relationship and especially in the mentor advisor relationship, if you think about what we do in the classroom um, or what you might be doing with your therapist is like the good therapist, the good teacher doesn't tell you the answer. They don't just say like, here's what you ought to do with your life. They sketch out your options for you. They give you some tools to help figure it out for yourself. And on Kierkegaard's account, that's exactly what art does. Okay, awesome. So can you talk us through that more, right? That, that uh, you know, you, you talk a lot about in, in, you know, the couple chapters that you write on this, right? That he's very anti-didactic didactic art, right? That art that's telling us what to do, which a lot of religious art does and a lot of other sorts of art does, 
right? Uh, Kierkegaard is very much against that. And so I guess the, the first question is, why is he so much against didactic art, right? It's there, it's a manual, it tells us what to do. And hey, it, it works for some people, so maybe it'll work for me, right? What What's wrong with didacticism, uh, which I probably just mispronounced, in, no, in art right. for Kierkegaard? No, that's, that's the right way to say it. Um, I mean, I think that like Kierkegaard does side with a long tradition of thinking that didacticism just makes for clunky art. Uh, but that's an aesthetic criticism um, and not the one that you're trying to get at. Um, I think he believes that, and this is like a religious position, that one person actually doesn't have the right to serve as an authority figure over anybody else. This is a sort of like anti-Catholic sort of view where you're going to have like a priest who's an intermediary between you and God. For Kierkegaard, it's very much each individual alone themselves before God. But even if you took God out of the picture, he's going to say that like, yes, there is this really important respect in which everybody has to make their own decisions in the end. And you might think, well, doesn't that militate against this friends helping each other, art helping each other? I don't like, and so people have beat me up on that point, but I think that they're misinterpreting what Kierkegaard is really trying to suggest here. It's like at the end of the day, you have to make a decision for yourself. That doesn't mean that the whole procedure all along the way has to be this solo independent thing. And so I guess like, what good art does is again, provide you with these tools, these resources to help you make a decision for yourself. Why? Because you yourself are ultimately responsible for your own decisions. Um, no other human being has the right, the prerogative to tell you what to do with your life. Now we might say like, oh, but what about adults and children? Sure, you know, there's lots of exceptions where we can talk about that, but. Yeah, right. And I mean, a, a lot of philosophy historically has been in the business of trying to tell people how to live their lives, right? I mean, you know, Epictetus has a handbook for how we should live our lives. And maybe some people follow Epictetus's advice to a T and uh, their life goes well enough for them. But I think a lot of us, what we do is precisely what you're saying is we take some from him, we take some from other people, we take this from that, we take some from art, we take some from religion, and we sort of cobble together this, you know, way of living that we ourselves find comfortable and that works well for us. It's not like this cookie cutter approach of, oh, Epictetus gave me the, the way to live or Confucius gave me the way to live or whatever. But even there with like Epictetus and Confucius or even Jesus, there's like, okay, maybe you get some answer about what to do, but it's a very abstract answer. You still have to put that answer into practice, into like the nitty gritty, dirty, complicated, contradictory details of your own life. And so there is still this ultimate decision-making. Jesus tells you to like, you know, like give up all you have and come follow me. Yeah, but what does that actually mean in concretion? Like literally give up everything I have. And so there is even in those cases, this like, responsibility to apply the abstract lesson to our concrete lives. Yeah, awesome. And so talk us then through the role art plays in helping us either discover or uncover or become who we are, right, as a self. Yeah, so how, so how exactly, if we're going to say like, oh, the art that's didactic that tells you to live this particular kind of concrete life, if that kind of art is bad, what's the good art look like? Um, there's a bunch of different answers here. And one simple answer is an answer that Kierkegaard pursues in his own literature. So something for people who aren't Kierkegaard familiars uh, out there. Um, Kierkegaard writes a lot of quasi novels, we might call them, um, where you get characters who are attempting to live in different ways. And they have various successes and failures at the various uh, strategies of life that they employ. But Kierkegaard doesn't tell you which of those characters you ought to try to imitate yourself. It's like, here are some options. You can try to be like this person and this is the kind of like troubles and problems you'll have to deal with. So a really short way of putting that is to say like, uh, works of art can sketch out possibilities for us. But I'm more interested in a second way that art can help us. And this is where we really get into the tool-based stuff. Um, and the, the metaphor that I often like to use is art serving as a, as a mirror for our own lives. We, when we read a novel, sometimes we don't just learn about the person in the novel, we learn about ourselves. And kind of like the classic example here is the story that the prophet Nathan tells David in the Hebrew Bible. So King David has committed adultery with Bathsheba and to cover it up, uh, he kills Bathsheba's husband. 
And Nathan thinks that, well, if I just come and tell him what to do, uh, he's just going to shut me down and he will, he'll be defensive about it. So instead, Nathan tells him a parable about this rich guy who has all of these, like the lambs in the world that he could slaughter for a party. But when the party time comes, instead, he kills his poor neighbor's one lamb. And David gets all upset. And then Nathan says, thou art the man. And the idea is that like when we're reading, I think that we all a novel, I think we often do that kind of stuff. We look at the characters and sometimes we try to put ourselves in the character's shoes and wonder like, oh, what would I do if I were Anna Karenina? But sometimes we say like, no, I actually am Anna Karenina. Like we feel personally convicted by the vices that the character possesses or maybe congratulatory at the virtues that the character possesses. We look at our own lives through the lens of the particular situations and scenarios and character traits that are described in works of art. That's going to work well for novels. Um, I have a whole other story to say about like, well, what about abstract art? Yeah. And so what, what thing that comes to mind there um, uh, is um, television shows and movies. We do that with very much so, right? That I'm it's such a Samantha, or I'm such a Chandler, right? And, and yeah. what do you think of though, that we can be wrong about that though, right? Yeah. That, that you could, you know, be a fan of friends It'd be like, oh, you know, you're sitting around at the coffee shop with your friends and say, oh, I am just such a Chandler. And the rest of your friends are like, really? You're more of a Ross. And then you're you like, you want to be a Chandler. You want to be a Chandler, right? And so it, it you know, in that sense, like you're, it, it's aspirational. And so it's more in like the role model mode that you were talking about before, right? That art can provide models for how to live, but you're misperceiving it or misconstruing it as, Oh, the Chandler's a mirror to me when really he's your role model. I don't know. What do you, what do you think about a, a case? And I mean, that case also involves like the collaborative process of getting feedback from your actual friends with respect to what the TV show friends can tell you about how you're living your life. So I'm starting to become more cynical about art as the project unfolds. And early on in, in the book, which I wrote like what, like seven years ago now, and that, you know, everything takes forever to get published. Um, in the book, I was pretty optimistic on that front. And the solution was actually exactly the kind of thing that you say, that it's like, yeah, we don't know ourselves very well. And so when you come up with some sort of framework for figuring out or trying to understand or interpret yourself, you need to bounce that off other people. And when your friends look at you sideways and say, like, you wish you were a Chandler, like, that's helpful information. And we need to attend to that. Um, I am becoming more worried as time goes on that art is more seductive than I gave it credit for, that it's better at seducing us into thinking that things are true about ourselves or even more so that things are possible for us um, that are not in fact possible for us. Um, but that's like, that's really starting to get into the second project and I don't know how much, how much time, how, how quickly we wanna go there yet. Yeah, no, I mean, I wonder how problematic that is actually, right? That that I can be confused that I'm a Chandler when I'm really a Ross. And yet that may help me live more like the Chandler that I want to be, right? It unleash yeah. the inner Chandler, right? And so I, I don't think it's necessarily a problem. I mean, maybe in particular cases, it's, you know, that form of self-delusion is is problematic, but you're sort of putting out into the world the type of person you want to be, and then you can be more like that person. If the result is striving to prove true the thing that you take you take to be true, then I agree with you. Um, there can be a kind of fake it till you make it sort of thing. Like a, a loftier, more highbrow version of this is Velleman's views about personal ideals. I don't know if you know that literature at all. Um, but Velleman basically says, like, if you start to think about yourself as a non-smoker and like put yourself, like imagine yourself into the mind of the non-smoker, that's actually going to help you become a non-smoker. Um, and there might be something to that, but I worry that the dark side of that is complacency. Like you don't struggle to become the person that you see yourself as being, you just accept that you are that person. And so it doesn't take any, like you don't work on it at all. You become complacent. Um, and why things go one way rather than another is probably going to depend on a lot the accidents of the, of the circumstance and the person involved. Yeah, right. And, and 
So could you talk us more through like how art appreciation works on this Kierkegaardian view, right? I mean, we sort of have the role model view where like, oh, I could, you know, aspire to be like this person or it's, I, you know, imagine myself in their shoes through like empathetic projection or something like that. And then there's the art as mirror thing. And so uh, is there more to the art as mirror thing or are there other dimensions of art appreciation yeah. from a Kierkegaardian standpoint? So I, I want to get into the art appreciation thing next because Kierkegaard does have a rather sophisticated view of what it takes to get out of art, what's valuable about it. Um, but I, maybe it's worth saying at least one more thing about the artist tool, artist cognitive tool view, um, which ties back in a little bit to abstract art. Because a lot of people will say something like, yeah, okay, this book this story that Kierkegaard is offering us works if I'm reading a novel or watching a TV show or a movie, but what about listening to like classical music or uh, abstract paintings or sculptures? And so the third component of the view is that uh, the story goes something like this. And I want to know whether you find this plausible. I haven't like directly, uh, I'm trying to remember if I've, uh, if I've talked with this particular aspect of Kierkegaard's view with somebody else before, but it goes to something like this. Abstract works of art, are, uh, including uh, absolute music, anything that's non-representational, is really good at evoking emotions. And for me, emotions can serve as lenses through which we view the world that highlight certain things about the world around us. When I'm angry, I tend to see the world in a certain way and certain aspects of the world pop out. So too when I'm sad or when I'm depressed. And so what happens is that a work of art can evoke a particular emotion in us. And that emotion, when we look at our own lives through that emotion, can cause certain aspects of our life to come to salience, to come become prominent that otherwise we were overlooking. And I have a silly example in the book, or I don't know, for me, it's a silly example, but it's a fun example. It's Robert Rauschenberg's monogram. It's not a totally abstract work, but monogram is a canvas that just has a bunch of random paint splattered on it that he put on the ground. And then he put a goat on the canvas and uh, is a stuffed taxidermy goat that he found in like a secondhand store. And uh, he didn't like it with the goat there. So then he put a tire around the goat and he was like, boom, done. <laughs> and that's so ridiculous. And I laughed out loud when I first saw it. And like the lightheartedness with which that whole uh, sculpture, I guess, uh, like meets your eye, like ends up being something through which I can view all of my existence. Like maybe I'm a little bit too self-serious when I'm like everything in my life has to be perfect. Like I've got to make sure it looks just beautiful and gorgeous and everything the right way. And here is Rauschenberg is like, maybe, you're, maybe your goat needs a tire around it. And uh and I think like that's just ridiculous and silly and funny. And um, that emotion of humor, I think is like another way, like another lens through which I can understand my life that's helpful. Yeah, no, I I like that view, right? That that different works of art and and you know, both abstract and non-abstract draw out different parts of ourselves, right? And uh, can make us aware of things in the world external to ourselves right, that, that we previously weren't aware of, right? And this is true both of representational things in terms of stories or just mere depictions, right? That, um, uh, you know, it's like the particular way, um, you know, a particular artist paints a particular scene, right, can draw our attention to ways of seeing it that, that weren't available to us. Like, oh, it really does look that way. I'd never seen clouds or thought of clouds in this way. And yet here's clouds depicted in this way and oh they kind of are like that right but i see nothing to prevent ourselves from turning that inward right that that and with abstract art and absolute music um you know is a, is a really good example of this it draws out emotional responses that can attune us to our own ways of experiencing emotion right um and that can you know make us more reflective on how we're living in the world and how we feel about things in the world, right? Because if, uh, and I mean, that can uh, uh, go in a few different ways, right? One that immediately comes to mind is, oh, this abstract work of art is giving me this powerful emotional experience. And yet this particular thing in my life that should be eliciting a, a powerful emotional experience just isn't, 
right? Um, and and so you know what that can make us aware of is our sort of failure of emotional attunement to our everyday lives, right? I, I think as as long as we're reflective in the right sort of way. I don't know. What are you thinking? Yeah, no, I think that's exactly true. I mean, I do think this is one way in which um, art might be able to shock us out of our depression, not clinical depression, probably, <laughs> um, uh, but subclinical depression. I mean, part of the problem I take it with depression is that we're um, we're failing to see the value of the things uh, in our life that's actually there. It's not that the world doesn't have any value. It's this we can't see it. And uh, part of the reason that we can't see it is that like our mood is this in this negative state. So that becomes self-reinforcing, right? We can't see anything that puts us in a bad mood so that we can't see anything valuable. Uh, the work, like a joyful song, a joyful tune um, lifts my spirits and with lifted spirits, all of a sudden I can see the valuable aspects of my life that I was previously unable to see because I was in such a sour mood, something like that. Yeah, I really, I really like that. And so does that segue into the view on self-transformation? Yeah, right. So could you talk us through that some? Oh, yeah. oh man. <laughs> Sorry. That's... <laughs> Uh, okay, that's going to be like pretty far afield. I guess the short answer is that like, um, yeah, that's that's certainly one way in which art could inspire us to change. Um, the art can change its view is going to be a little bit farther afield and I hadn't made a connection to that in particular, but maybe I feel like maybe that's the way that I'm going to think about it. Like I have not thought about it. I was thinking about talking about art appreciation at this yeah, juncture. Yeah, go for it. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> Like the question becomes like, oh yeah, but Tony, not everybody's doing like the kind of thing that you're talking about doing. Isn't that like a little bit of a weird way to appreciate art? Um, uh, it seems kind of like really egoistic to like use art as a tool for thinking about your own life and self improvement. And yeah, uh, and it's yeah, certainly yeah. not it's certainly not Kantian, right? It's not yeah. disinterested. It's, it's the disinterested. opposite of disinterested. Yeah, so the next chapter in the book um, is really about the proper form of art appreciation. And it gets tricky because, like, Kierkegaard, on the one hand, sometimes talks about disinterest as the proper way of engaging in art appreciation. Um, and then in other moments, he takes it back. And so my view is that, like, his better view is the one where he takes it back. Uh, so just like for the people in our audience who might not be familiar with the tradition of disinterest, um, there's like a couple of different ways that it goes. A uh, really robust form of disinterest says when you're appreciating work of art, you should appreciate it for, for its own sake. You shouldn't think about any payoffs it has for any other human interests that we might possess. So like bracket all those things for your mind, focus on the work itself and nothing else. Well, that's really radical. Um, <laughs> So you might have like a slightly dialed back version of disinterest that we see people like Noel Carroll today adopt, um, where it's like, oh, no, you could think about how an art contributes to society in general or other human interests that we have. What you have to bracket is your own personal private interests. And someone like Carroll would say, like, the task of art appreciation is this sizing up activity. you got to figure out whether the work of art achieves the purpose that it sets for itself. And if you're going to make that judgment, you have to be objective about it, unbiased. And how do we go about making unbiased judgments? Well, we set aside our own personal preferences and interests and concerns and our beliefs and opinions. We check all of that at the door. But if that's what you're going to do when you're appreciating art, then all of the stuff that we talked about for the last half hour, you're not going to be able to get out of a work of art. So Kierkegaard, in the end, has to reject that. And I have a bunch to say about like, what exactly the right form of art appreciation would look like. So what would the right form of art appreciation look like from the Kierkegaardian perspective that you're advancing? It's a two-step model. The first step is to acquire some kind of objective understanding of the work itself. So Kierkegaard can talk about disinterest, but then we have to figure out what that... Uh, what the end or goal or content of the work means for our own individual lives. And that's not just because he cares about like existential matters at the end of the day. 
he thinks it's actually a matter of like really understanding the work in a deep way or really understanding anything in a deep way. And the story here that always hits home for me is Tolstoy's death of Ivan Ilyich. So Ilyich knows that he's going to die, but like he can't come to terms with that fact. He knows what death means for other people, but like, like that he's like he himself going to die, like just doesn't compute. And Kierkegaard thinks that that's true of all concepts whatsoever, like all ideas whatsoever. If we're only thinking about them in an abstract way, or we only think about them as they apply to other other people, we have only a superficial understanding of those ideas. And we might think about this in terms of like racism or sexism. Like if you only understand racism in our culture as it applies to your neighbor, or as you can talk about it in some philosophical classroom kind of conversation context, or we only understand sexism in those kinds, and you can't see at all what it means for your own life and whether you yourself are racist or sexist, you don't really understand racism or sexism. Or maybe the nicer way to put it is that you have a superficial understanding of it. So for Kierkegaard, even to grasp like the meaning of a work in a deep way, you have to apply it to yourself. You have to see what its ramifications are for your own life. So that's part of this like process of just understanding what the work is all about. Yeah. And so, yeah, that, that, but I mean, that's not going to be true for all art, right? That some art, we just like, can't figure out how to incorporate it into our own lives or sort of see it through ourselves. Right. So there's the question of whether all concepts whatsoever are self-implicating in that way. Like obviously some are like death, happiness, beauty, um, but there might be a bunch that aren't, um, you know, <laughs> so I like, I don't think, I mean, Kierkegaard does sometimes talk that way. He does some, sometimes seem to think that even stuff like the cogito, like, isn't a merely abstract thing. Um, even something like, like, I mean, he actually thinks that's a powerful, like Cartesian skepticism, like all of the Hegelians in his time were like really interested in Cartesian skepticism. And Kierkegaard is like, have you ever tried to be skeptical in your own life? You know, like, isn't that really kind of hard? And once you realize that, your understanding of skepticism changes. So I don't know, Kierkegaard does sometimes talk about how like every idea and every concept whatsoever is self-implicating. Um, I don't know if I want to toe that line, but it is an interesting conjecture. Yeah, right. And so then from the Kierkegaardian view that you're giving us right that to like genuinely understand or have a deeper understanding of a work of art you need to go beyond the disinterested although that is sort of the first phase is like to come to terms with the object itself right what is this thing saying how is it saying it in its own terms right and then there's that next step of well, what does it say about me right or, or how can i use this to help me figure out my self or something of that sort right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. So he calls it double reflection. The first step of reflection is this object. He calls it objective reflection. And the second step is subjective reflection. And if you only stop at the objective level, you're an assistant professor. <laughs> you got to make your way to associate then full, right? <laughs> I love that. No, that's really cool. Um, yeah. And I, I mean, I can see the value of that. And I mean, is okay here here's a question and this sort of ties stuff together that we've been talking about right is that second step something we can do together with others right that we can help each other think through that second phase of not just like you know we're in an art history class or a music appreciation class and we're talking through the the work of art be it a, a painting or a sculpture or a piece of music uh, in this sort of more objective, unbiased mode, right? But is that something we can do together with others is think about its implications for how we should think through ourselves? I feel like it ought to be on the sort of view you're giving, right? Yeah, and here I think, um, I guess I have a couple of things to say about that. Here I do think that Kierkegaard might be wrong because he often does seem to suggest that that subjective level is the private and personal level. Um, I will say that sometimes we talk this way, um, especially if you've taught a philosophy of religion class, you got to overcome this a lot. Like students come in with this view that like faith is a private and personal matter. It's something that's for me in my life. And if you really toe that line, then you're like, well, we can't talk about that in class because class is a public space. 
um, sometimes we don't want to share things with certain others um, because we say that's private, that's personal, that's mine. Um, but I don't think that that's, and sometimes Kierkegaard seems to think that that's an in-principle constraint. He talks about what he calls uh, accidental secrets and essential secrets. So an accidental secret is like the password for your computer. Like you, you could share it to other people, you just choose not to. An essential secret is something that you could not even in principle share with other people. And Abraham's faith as he walks up Mount Moriah to sacrifice his son is supposed to be this essential secret, something that he can't possibly share. And the subjective dimension of all of the things we're talking about is supposed to be this essential secret that we cannot possibly communicate with other people. And I just don't think that that's quite right. Um, I think it's hard to share sometimes. We may be uncomfortable sharing it at times. Um, we may not be able to share it perfectly. Um, and if some of Fricker's stuff about epistemic injustice is right, uh, we may lack the concepts because of how society has been set up in order to explain and describe our circumstances adequately to somebody else. That may be, but th I think that's a contingent fact, not a necessary one. In principle, if we enriched our conceptual resources and our linguistic capabilities, we would be able to share these with certain others. We might not want to share them with everybody, but at least with certain other close people, it could be a more serious version of the friend discussion that you described earlier, where you said like, oh, you're not a Chandler. Yeah, that's jocular, but like something like that could happen well between, you know, serious friends. Awesome. So uh, is this a good point to move to the, the self-transformation stuff? Maybe. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Let's, let's do, do, it. do it. Let's do it. Um, that stuff is newer and I have like my elevator spiel less worked out for it. Um, but it goes something like this. <laughs> so early project, how can art help us understand ourselves? Second project, how can art change us? And of course, art can change us in ways both big and small. And I think some of the things that we've been talking about have been some of the smaller ways uh, in this new project, I'm interested in how art can change us in some of the most monumental ways, the kind of ways that L.A. Paul calls transformations. And the crux of my view is that art doesn't do this in a straightforward way, which of course fits with like the indirect style of stuff before. Um, it does so in ways that are like hidden and duplicitous. So it's probably not quite right to say that like art motivates us to change. It's better to say that art seduces us into becoming different people than we are. And um, sometimes that can be for bad, as we see in propaganda and certain advertisements, but I think it can also be for the good, um, as we see in a lot of the political and moral art that is dominating the contemporary art scene in New York right now, where art is like, where people who are trying to get us to care more and more deeply about racism and sexism use the power of art to get us to be transformed from not caring to caring about the suffering of some particular people. Yeah, and so do you have an account, I mean, sketched out even of how art is capable of doing that, right? Like how does art seduce us to become better or worse versions of ourselves? So I don't know if I have an elevator spiel, but I can try walking through the long version. Sure. Um, this paper just came out like two days ago. <laughs> I mean, it's been online. Uh, but it's out in the Journal of the American Philosophical Association. Um, it's called Art and Transformation. And the paper involves using uh, L.A. Paul's notion of transformative experiences as a framework. And one of Paul's central claims is that trans transformative experiences or transformations are hard to motivate. Um, and in my, in my uh, article, I argue that there's two reasons why. First, um, because uh, when we undergo a transformation, we don't know what we're getting ourselves into. Part of undergoing a transformation is that you're doing something brand new. Because we don't know what we're getting ourselves into, we don't know whether we'll like it or not like it. Um, and so we don't know like what value to assign it and how to compare it with our other options. We're kind of shooting around in the dark there. So that's problem number one. Um, problem number two is that like, 
even if we did know exactly what it was like to get into some new, like have a child or go off to college or join a new religion or start embracing, you know, woke morality, like even if we knew exactly what that would involve, that might not be enough to motivate us to do it. And my favorite example has to do with Ellie Paul's core case of parenting. Um, so the idea is like, suppose you knew what it would be like to have your first child and you knew that you would be happy. In fact, you knew for a fact, I don't think you can know this for a fact, but you suppose you knew for a fact that you'd be happier than you would be if you didn't have a child. Would that be enough to persuade you to have a child? No, because you might not want to be happy in that particular way. Being happy in that particular way might be a betrayal of your current values. Um, and so you might think that like you're justified in choosing an action that would in fact, not choosing an action that would in fact make you happier. And so in this paper, I argue that art can help us with both of those problems. Art can help us sort of understand what it would be like to go through experiences that we've never had before. And art can seduce us into um, doing things that we don't want to do. That's really interesting. And so can you talk us through the first one that that art can, I mean, I think that one's more straightforward in a way, right? That, you know, seeing movies about parenthood or reading books about parenthood could make uh, a non-parent give them a sense of what it's like to be a parent, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. And so there's a bunch of different ways this um, this happens. And I'm working on another article that should be coming out pretty soon where I kind of walk through in detail a bunch of the ways in which art does this. Um, the most important one is by piecing together a bunch of other experiences that we've had and kind of like scaffolding up to the new experience. So Amy Kind has this notion of uh, imaginative scaffolding where she's like, a lot of what L.A. Paul calls brand new experiences aren't like brand, brand new, but they're like pulling together bits and pieces they're made up of an amalgam of lots of other experiences that we have had. And so what art does is it guides us through the process of piecing together um, some of those other experiences that we have had to generate a sense of what this new experience would be like. But I also think that art is often pretty good at just replicating some of like the core sensory aspects of experiences we haven't had. And like the, it's kind of a clunky old example, but the opening of Saving Private Ryan is actually pretty darn good at helping us know what it would be like to storm the beach at Normandy, even if we haven't ever done that before ourselves. And presumably you and I are too young to have done that. How do we know that it does that reliably? Well, because the people who actually stormed the beach at Normandy said that that was pretty good. So that's the first part of the story. Yeah, awesome. And so how about the, the art can seduce us to do stuff that we presently don't want to do? Like, how does that work? This is where things get darker. So there's actually a lead up to it. Um, and that's that like, well, the pro the real problem with art is that it really only tells you what the experience is like for somebody else. It doesn't tell you what that experience is going to be like for you. And the other person's experience might not generalize, especially if we're talking about a fictional character. So what I think art is actually pretty good at doing is confusing us on that score and tricking us into thinking that the way things go for the person in the work of art is the way that things go for us. And it has to do with a particular error that we make when we're like, so we're bad at forecasting. This is just like an objective empirical fact, but we're not bad in just any old way. We're bad in that we tend to project what we'd like to happen or what would be ideal. And so what the work of art does is it makes us want things to go the way that we see for the character. And so then when we're trying to project, since we project what we want to, we end up like we're inclined to project in the way that the art suggests. That doesn't work for all works of art, of course, um, but that's like one possible story. But then we get to the meat and potatoes part, um, which is okay, still, how does art get us to like things that we don't already like? Do you want me to? Yeah, if you could briefly, that'd be awesome. Um... It's not by showing us something about the experience or the activity itself that's appealing. I think that's a temptation that a lot of people give into. They think that art reveals some core value that the experience itself has. It like illuminates us to something we didn't see. 
I don't think that's true. Um, especially because it's not going to help in cases like the parenthood case where it's like, yeah, I know it has to offer. I'm not like, I get it right. I just don't want it. So instead what happens is that art adds something extrinsic to the experience. Um, and the extrinsic thing that it uh, offers us is like uh, the pleasure of uh, aesthetic value. It layers, uh, it layers kind of like beauty over the top. It clothes it in beauty. And uh, that beauty draws us in and it gets us to engage with the idea of the experience long enough that like the power of habituation and exposure take over. And we find ourselves like, oh, I didn't used to like this, but like I've been so captivated by art that's about this that now I find myself liking it. What happened? Ah, habituation and exposure got the better of you. Yeah, and it, it's beauty that's doing that work of drawing us in. And so it's, you know, it, it's functioning as like, the spoonful of sugar that helps the bitter medicine go down essentially. Except what's tricky is that, um, or the chocolate that the parent offers the child to get them in Aristotle, like the Aristotelian case, to do the virtuous activity and eventually the child likes the virtuous activity for its own sake. It's that story, but like about whatever it is that art is offering. The tricky thing, what's worse than the child case is at least in the child case, the child can separate the reward from the activity. You like the chocolate is one thing. The activity that you want me to do is something else. The problem in the art case is that the artist like interweaves the beautiful properties with the experience itself. So we can't discern what's actually part of the activity and what the artist just like added to it. And so we get confused about what we're being drawn to. And so we think that we're being drawn to the thing itself when really we're not. And this happens all the time in advertisements. This is why advertisements work. We think we're going to look great in that shirt. No, you just like attracted to the model. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. And so, you know, when it comes to like your your story of art appreciation, right? That as art appreciators, given what you're describing now, we need to be sort of more skeptical in a way and have our guard up in a way that that we're not being seduced in these sort of subliminal subconscious ways that we need to be more careful as art consumers and appreciators. Oh, uh, so you've you've fallen into my trap. <laughs> So that is the tempting move. Like I really like the tempting move to steal ourselves against the deceptive power of art. Like that's what Plato would encourage us to do, or maybe even call for censorship. You know, I think that like a lot of the cultural critics that are trying to ban books these days are trying to do so because they're savvy to something like the story that I'm telling. But I think their response is wrong. Why? Because I think there's more to be gained by opening up to art. I think there's more to be gained by being vulnerable. Um, in particular, and this is like the Nick Riggle side of myself, where it's like, if we really want to fall in love with another person, we have to open ourselves up to them to let them change us. I think the same thing is true of art. If we really want to fall in love with garage band metal or bad movies or high food or whatever else we we can't have this like oh what is it going to do to me skeptical mentality we have to let it affect us in the way that it is maybe it's going to change us yeah but like maybe your partner boyfriend girlfriend or whoever is going to change you too and if you're going to really love them and fall in love with them you have to be open to that and i think like wriggle that like falling in love with art is like one of life's greatest things and so you can be cautious and say but you're losing out on some of the great things that life has to offer. Awesome. Thank you. So on that note, I think we'll, we'll end it. That's a really good place to stop. So, so Tony, thank you so much for joining me. Um, once again, the book we're discussing is art and selfhood, a Kierkegaardian account. Uh, Tony, thank you so much for joining me. This was a really fun discussion. Thanks Brandon for having me again. It is a real honor to be here. I love this series. I share it with people all the time. Um, it's such a great resource for people to learn about different aspects of aesthetics and philosophy of art. You're doing this tremendous service. You deserve all of the uh, accolades that you're getting for this. Well, thank you. So uh, hit like and subscribe. And on that note, we'll be done. So thanks. <laughs> <laughs>